Matthew chapter 26, we'll be looking at verses 36 through 46. If you can only imagine how difficult it is to pick a text somewhere between uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, there's a lot. There's a lot to look at in the life of Jesus at that time, a, a lot that was going on uh, in his relationship with his disciples, in his relationship with the religious leaders and those all around him, uh, even with the Father and so forth. But this one thing that, that just just popped out at me uh, really moved me in, in a fresh way because it's probably a pivotal point in the life of Christ and, and his disciples to look at the prayer in the garden, to decide to reject his own will and seek the Father's will. Not himself, or his desires and his wants, his dreams, his future, but what is the Lord's dreams? What is the Lord's desire? What does the Lord have for me in the future? Because he said he had a future and a hope for us all. And so a pivotal point for us. I think this was where the battle was really fought. The results of that battle was the crucifixion. The results of the crucifixion was the resurrection. But here's where the battle was fought, where, where Jesus was on his knees praying and seeking the Father's will. You'll find that uh, fervent prayer always costs us something. To be fervent in prayer <clears throat> costs us time, costs us effort. It costs us ourself because it takes time and effort and self to pray and to really fervently pray on your knees. I, I've read so many of the old timers, you know, the the um, Spurgeons and the Whitfields and the the um, oh the Methodist brothers and 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 so forth, and and you read their life stories about prayer and some of them just prayed six hours a day six hours I, I can't imagine six hours of prayer every day getting up early in the morning and, and and spending six hours just talking to the Lord and seeking the Lord and desiring the Lord's will to be done asking for power and strength and, and who knows what else they asked for at that time and place that's a lot of time isn't it I think about all the stuff I need to do when I wake up in the morning. There's so much to do, and there's always so much to do. And yet we neglect prayer so much. It costs. It costs us something. You know, if you're willing to get hurt, then if you're willing not to get hurt, then you're not willing to allow God to use you. Think about that one for a second. Because in prayer and in being used, it does cost, and sometimes that cost is painful. It cost Jesus himself a lot of pain to pray and to finally submit to the Father's will. Three times he prayed in the garden, and it cost him his life, his life. Extreme situations take extreme actions, and prayer is always the way to go. I think Paul said it so well that we don't fight against powers and principalities of the air. I'm sorry, against uh, flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of the air. And so there's an extreme situation that, that takes place in our lives, and so we fight it in the powers and principalities of the air, not against flesh and blood. And, and that's extreme when you think about it, the demonic forces that are out there and the strength that they have. And yet here we are in the power of Jesus Christ, and through his son's name, we have power and strength. And that takes extreme measures. And the work of God through his son Jesus really is at stake here. Let me share with you a story, and the story is lengthy, but I think that um, it relates to tonight's message, and it gives us an idea of what it costs us when we are prayer warriors, when we're Christians, and we call ourselves Christians, and we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for the Lord's will to be done. It is a historical story. Uh, it's a story that was um, written probably in 8320. St. Bezel was a great man of God, one of the greatest church fathers, and he writes a sermon that was dedicated to the memory of 40 martyrs who were ordered by the officers in the year 320 to sacrifice to heathen idols. 
So these 40 officers who were believers in Christ, they were ordered to sacrifice to foreign gods. And as Christians, you know that's something that we, we don't do. These were soldiers who had proven to be excellent in every respect. But the emperor issued a decree that they must renounce Christ or else their lives would be in danger. Those who refused to give up Christ were submitted to indescribable brutalities and tortures. The torturers were called, he writes, and the first was ready and the sword was sharpened. Then some of the persecuted Christians fled, others succumbed, others wavered, and some before even being submitted to tortures were afraid because of their threatenings. Some, when facing the tortures, became faint. Others entered the battle but were not able to persevere to the end in suffering the pains. And in the middle of the martyred, martyrism, they renounced Christ. However, the invincible and gallant soldiers of Christ proceeded with courage. Without being afraid of anything which they saw or losing their head as a result of the threatenings, they confessed that they were Christians. Now these are soldiers that fought for an emperor and they were in a situation where they had a choice and they chose not to support the emperor but to support the king of kings and the lord of lords. He goes on and says, these Christian soldiers were offered money, honors in order to induce them to join the ranks of the heathens, earthly honors they would not yield to. Then came threats and indescribable tortures. What an answer these Christian soldiers gave. Here's what they said. Do you have blessings of equal value to those you endeavor to deprive us of, to give us? We hate your gifts because it will mean our loss. We do not accept honor, which is the mother of dishonesty. You offer us money, which remains here, glory, which fades away. We have despised the whole world. These things which we see in the world do not have for us the value of the heavenly things which we hope and long for. We are afraid of only one punishment, the punishment of hell. We are here ready to be tortured for you, to twist our bodies and burn them. The judge was furious by the courage of these brave Christians and so he devised a slow and most painful way of putting them to death. It was very cold. He waited for the night when the wind was violent and the air freezing, and he ordered the soldiers to be thrown naked on the frozen lake in the center of the town to die from freezing. There is no more dreadful and painful death than that. These Christian soldiers did not have to be forced to take off their clothes. They gladly took their clothes off. They took them off themselves, marched on to the frozen lake, and as each went, he said, we are not merely putting off our clothes, but we are putting off our old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Ephesians 22 is what they were quoting. Altogether, they shouted, the winter is bitter, but heaven is sweeter. The freezing pain, but sweet the rest. Let us preserve a little longer and we shall be warmed in the bosom of the Christ. Let us exchange all of eternity for the pain of one night. How many soldiers have died in battle remaining faithful to a mortal king? And we, for the sake of remaining faithful to the true king, shall we not sacrifice this life? We are going to die anyway. Let us die so that we may live. Their prayer was unanimous and ascending with one voice. Forty have we entered this ordeal. May all forty of us receive the crown of martyrdom. O Lord, grant that not one of our member may yield. You honor this number because you fasted forty days. In spite of the earnest prayer, one of, the, one of their numbers did not persevere and he gave in to the officers of the heathen persecutors. Great sorrow came upon the others because they, 39, remained in the arena of death. Their plea became even more <clears throat> vigorous as their heavenly or to their Heavenly Father. Forty entered the ordeal and forty wanted to see the face of the Lord. The deserter came to the warm place prepared by the emperor's executioners, but going from the extreme cold to the warm, 
He plundered himself into warm water where he died instantly. The guard, a heathen who was watching all the development and saw angels ministering to these saints of God, on hearing their prayers, decided to answer them. He took off his clothes, declared with a loud voice, I am a Christian too. And he jumped naked on the frozen lake, joining the 39 to complete their number to 40. Thus their prayer was answered. Forty entered the ordeal of martyrdom, and forty saw the face of Jesus. Wow. That's powerful. True story. True story. Not my will, but your will be done. Or not as I will, as Jesus said. That's the theme of today's message. Let's go ahead and read the text. Chapter 26, verses 36 through 42. Okay, I'm not finding it. <laughs> oh, 36, 26. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, he who betrayed me is at hand. So Jesus is here in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. It says that Jesus came right there in verse 36. In the Greek, it suggests that Jesus literally took them and not, not they took Jesus. Jesus, after the supper, knew that there was a time of prayer that was needed before his sacrifice was to commence. And so he literally took several of the disciples with him to this event to go and pray there in Gethsemane. And he said to those disciples to sit here and I go and I will go over there and pray. So Jesus prays vehemently, as the old King James would say, or vigorously uh, on his knees there in the garden of Gethsemane, a lush olive garden on the east side of Jerusalem there near the slope of the Mount of Olives. When I was in Israel, I stood in that place. We walked from the Mount of Olives on the top and we walked our way down to the garden and you could see uh, the old Jerusalem there, the, the eastern wall and the gates with the cemetery in, in front of it. Of all the places that we visited Israel there, that was the one place that I was really moved at. Oh, we went down to the river, as I shared with you before, where John the Baptist was baptizing. I didn't really care about being baptized again. And, and that was exciting for everyone else, but it wasn't as exciting as it was for me. And we went to even Golgotha, where they had crucified Jesus. And today there's actually a bus station right underneath it. And smog is just going up all over the place. And it wasn't as exciting to me. Even the tomb of Jesus, uh, where he was resurrected, we were able to see the little tomb and walk into it and see where they laid his body and so forth. You could actually see the, the track where the stone probably rolled over the entrance of the place. And it was, that was awesome, too. And, and by the way, that where they did crucify him, if you look at it closely enough, it does look like a skull. You can see the eyes and kind of a, a mouth, and it looks like the skull. And so they call it the, the, the Mount of the Skull. But this place here, the garden, I don't know what it was. Uh, they had it 
fenced off where the olive trees were at. They didn't want people coming in and out. They did have a little gate so that they could maintain the area. And there were some people uh, in that area, so probably those that were privileged to go into that area, but we weren't allowed to go in there. I, I wish we could have. There was an olive tree there that looked pretty big. Uh, they suggested it was at least 500 to maybe uh, 600 years old. as not old enough that it could have been the, the uh, place where Jesus literally... Um, kneeled down and began to pray to the Father. But we stood there and we were just looking at the olive trees. We we're looking at the area. We could see Jerusalem. And I don't know, there was just something about that place that just really moved me. The place where Jesus was on his knees and he was battling the flesh. That's what he was doing. Battling his flesh. His flesh that wanted to conquer him, control him. Uh, divert from his plan he had to succumb that with prayer not with might and strength but simply with prayer and strength from the father in the spiritual realm and that just moved me that i literally weeped there on the wall of a building that they now have put there and i kind of went off by myself and just was so moved by the fact that Christ stood in that very place where I stood. Amazing place there. The word Gethsemane is derived from two Hebrew words. Gath, which means a place for pressing oil. <coughs> or sometimes wine. And then Shemin, which means oil. So pressing oil or pressing olives is what the word means. Thus the olive trees. During the time of Christ here, they would take a heavy stone and they would take a, a bucket of some sort or a container where they would throw the olives in and crush them to a certain degree. And then they would use the stone to crush it the rest of the way. And they would call that the virgin oil when the, the pressing was so severe that they squeezed out every little drop of that olive oil from that uh, pit there. Today it's a little different. I, I actually looked it up. And today they take all the olives, tons and tons of them, and they throw them into a container, and they literally crush it all up. Just crush it all up together, just grind it together, and they make a paste. Then they boil it. And then after they boil it, the oil and the water separate, and the oil goes to a certain area, and then they create the, the oil that way. I, I like this picture better because this does give us a picture of what Jesus was going through. He was being pressed. Uh, at, at this point, in prayer, at this point of his life, he was literally being pressed from all perspectives of life, from, from the Father himself desiring his will, from his flesh, from the disciples, from those that were coming, from the world, from the sins that would be laid upon him. Everything was pressing on him, all the weight. So you can imagine being that, that olive pit and already being crushed, and then Tons coming still upon you to crush out as much more as they could just get out of you. And they were going to get it out of Jesus. And they did. Because the weight of sin of the world would be put upon him, pressed upon him, like that heavy slab of rock that would press upon the olives there. That's my sin and, and your sins that would be laid on his shoulders so that we could have eternal life so that God could view us as sinless in a sense he took our sins and he bore the punishment for our sins that's like standing before the judge and you have a lawyer with you and the judge says okay I have found you to be guilty of these crimes and the lawyer says judge I will I will take the punishment uh, for him and so they do the paperwork the legalities of it all, and, and then on the paperwork they show that you're not guilty, but the advocate, the lawyer, is guilty, and he's taking the punishment, and he gets to go to jail. Your record is completely clean. How fair is that? <laughs> That's not fair at all. That's gracious. That's wonderful, but but it's not fair when you committed the crime, and yet this person was willing to come in and take the punishment for you and that's what jesus has done for us to take our sins and lay them upon his shoulders and take the punishment for them his sweat like drops of blood falling from the ground 
flowed like the olive oil which was squeezed out into a bucket. Luke 22 talks about that. That he was so stressed that he began to sweat blood from all of his pores because of the stress that was upon him. That's prayer. <laughs> that is when you're really in prayer and you are really seeking the face of God. You can just imagine what he was going through and you can understand why he needed this prayer he needed this prayer he needed the power and the strength of his father in heaven to fulfill his plan being god and i know we can look at him and say well he's god he could take it right no 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 we don't understand he was god but he's also man he was a hundred percent man he wasn't 99.9 percent .9 man he was a hundred percent man he felt everything we feel Everything we feel, Hebrews is very clear that we have a high priest who has been tempted in every way, that we've been tempted. So he felt everything. He felt the, the pain and the suffering, the weight, the stress and all of that. And, and that's how he approached the situation through his humanity without the help of his deity. Though his deity made him pure and holy and perfect without blemish so that he could be that lamb as an offering unto the Lord. But he approached the struggles in this life as a man so he needed prayer and it says and he said to his disciples disciples sit here while i go and pray over there and so prayer is the most powerful tool that god has given us and yet it seems like we don't utilize it as much i know i don't and, and i'm a pastor and i don't utilize it as much i know i kind of fall back on what paul said pray without ceasing well how do you do that well you're just in prayer all day long and, and I do that all day long. And, and I'll get prayers from people and I'll put them on the uh, on email and it gets sent out to everyone else who's probably working and doing things and they get the email text and they pray right there on the spot. And that's how you pray without ceasing. But to literally pray in agony and to get on your face and really pray that's something that I can honestly say that I don't do. I don't pray as much as I used to pray in the beginning. And that's sad for me to even to admit to you right now. <laughs> I can remember going out witnessing downtown Riverside at the old bus station there. It's still there, but now there's a building in front of it. And me and a friend of ours uh, would, uh, would go down every Friday night, and we would at least spend an hour to two praying before we went down there. Usually meet up at his house or my house, and, and we would just pray and just wait on the Lord. And then we would go out there, and some wonderful things happened, great things happened. Attacks even happen, which you know, when there's attacks, you know, again, through prayer, there's going to be pain. There's, you're going to sacrifice something. Uh, one, one time we were on our way home after witnessing to all kinds of people, people coming to the Lord, you know, planting, watering and all that. And, and as our, we were on our way home, we heard this shot and it was literally a gunshot. And, and we heard it ricochet off the windshield of our car and then go off the other end. And then when we got back to the place, it was literally... Uh, right where I was sitting and driving. And if it would have came through the window, it would have hit me and then probably hit the guy behind me if it was a rifle. But it was that close. But somehow it ricocheted. You, you could see the glass broken there and it just kind of shot off. Just stuff like that that would happen. Uh, pimps who were out there and, and we would start ministering to uh, their, their slaves, I guess. Uh, people, <laughs> I don't know what they call them. <laughs> Prostitutes, whether male or female. And, and they would threaten you and and so forth or guys that said they had guns and they were going to shoot you on the spot if you know we were threatened that way but it was the prayer that got us through and jesus understood that so go and sit a while and over there while i go and and pray and those that pray oftentimes they find themselves alone in prayer don't they oftentimes it's just you and the lord and no one else it's it's wonderful to have group prayers but more than often, it, it's awesome to have prayer alone. But Jesus finds himself alone. Even his disciples couldn't pray with him. And it's interesting because Isaiah 63 talks about that. He's, it says, I have trodden the winepress alone. This is speaking of Jesus during this prayer time. I've, I've trodden the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment. And I will stain my remnant. Right? He was alone. 
it was him and the Father, really. He wasn't alone. He was there with the Father. And sometimes we might feel alone. We might feel it's just us, and here we go again, and no one else is with me, but God's there with us. And we're praying to the one who can change things, the, the one who has the power and authority to do awesome things in our lives and in the lives of others. So verse 37, he took him. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be very sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now, he takes these three guys, and I don't know why he takes three three guys. These three guys are known for, for their strength and their power, or their anger, their, their, their uh, boldness and so forth. Peter, you know, put his foot in his mouth several times, you know, uh, talking about how you're the Christ, you know, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, or you're not going to go up to the, to uh, be crucified. No one will take you. I'll fight for you. I'll, you know, I'll pull out the sword if I have to. Even in even in the garden situation, he pulled out a sword, cut off an ear of, of one guy. Very bold, bold guy, but yet he couldn't stay up and pray. And then you had the two sons who uh, were known as the sons of thunder. There was a situation where Jesus was in and the people didn't want Jesus to be ministering there. And so they kind of went to Jesus. Hey, shall we call thunder down on them? Just wipe them all out because <laughs> they got so angry. I guess those are the guys you really want to bring if you want to prove a point that they're really not as strong as they say they are. You know, they're actually weak. They're not meek. They're just they're just foolishly bold <laughs> in a sense. Uh, they say all the things that they can do and will do, but they really don't do anything. And that was Peter. And I think it was a time of humiliation, especially for Peter, because he would go on to cut the guy's ear and then uh, watch Jesus go through this whole ordeal of trials and then run off denying the Lord, as just like he said. And boy, that would really humble a person, right? And sometimes we do that. We say things to people and places and so forth, and then we get humbled because we don't, Either we don't really mean it or we mean it, but we know we don't have the strength and power to do it. And that's why it's best to just say the Lord's will be done. You know, and if the Lord's willing and he gives me strength, then I will if I can. And so he takes these guys with him. I don't know if they're necessarily the right guys, but maybe they are. And it says that he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So here's the beginning of the stress. He hasn't prayed yet, but he's thinking about it. And, and, and he's starting to get sorrowful. And distress, but not just distress, deeply. I mean, this is the stuff that starts bringing the stress in your life. Starts to get the heart to pound a little bit. The stuff that brings anxiety. You know, all those bad things that we don't like. The doctor says, calm down, relax, go exercise, eat right, you know, type of thing. And he's going through it all at this very moment. It was six days earlier in John chapter 12, verse 27, where Jesus said, My soul is troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So he was, he, he knew he was leading up to this at this moment. And so he was really a man of sorrows, wasn't he? And of struggles. Verse 38, and he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, it's interesting in the Greek uh, for the word soul. He's saying, my soul the word soul there is literally his emotions. He's speaking about the seat of emotions there. So he is talking about his emotions, his feelings, and how he's feeling. And so you know that he's dealing with this in his humanity. And his emotions are beginning to move, in a sense, becoming sorrowful, even feeling like, I'm going to die. I, I don't think he was saying it in such a way, I want to die. I feel like I'm going to die. But, and he was in a little while. But at that moment, I don't have those anxieties. Uh, I know people who do. <clears throat> my brother was one of them, and I remember going to his house one day. been trying to get my brother to come to the Lord for years, and all of a sudden he gets these anxiety attacks. And so now he's off of work and he's dealing with this. And he calls me up one night and says, I can't take this, I can't take this. He's, he's really emotional, really stressed out uh, over this thing. I mean, his voice, everything's changing. He's even sweating. So I, I went all the way down there and I, you know, I basically said, hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to give this to him. You need to give your life and surrender it all and God will help you through this. And he did right at, right at that moment. He, he gave his heart unto the Lord. 
but he kept saying, I just want to die, I just want to die, I just want to die. You know, he just didn't want to go through it. It, it, was a, it was so difficult and so painful that he was like, let's just get this over with, you know, in a sense. And I guess that's what happens when you become stressed. I think the word probably is better used like uh, with uh, Samson and Delilah when she's beginning to press him. And he says that his soul was vexed to death. You know, not that he's dying, but you're pressing me so hard that it's beginning to, to hurt there, in, in a sense. Turn to Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament. I mean, Jesus was a man of sorrows. You have sorrows. You have stress in your life. There's pain. You have worries, but the Bible says not to worry. Bible says, cast your burdens, your cares on him because he cares for you. But yet we all have sorrows. We all suffer through these things. Well, so did Jesus. In Isaiah, verse 1 it says, Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has formed he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. Have you been rejected by men? Do people despise you? Are there people that don't like you? There are people that didn't like Jesus. You know what? Forget those that don't like you. Just move on. That's their problem, not yours. <laughs> you don't have to worry about them liking you. The only person you have to worry about that God likes you. In, in fact, he loves you. He thinks you're adorable. <laughs> he gave his, God gave his son for you. you know. So don't worry that people don't like you. They despise you, reject you. It says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, is he a man of sorrow? Sure is. He sure is. I don't think he walked around like that all day long. And you know, oh, sorrow, you know. We have to be careful, but at this point, you can see all the sorrow coming up. You know, I'm sure that he walked around and he trusted in the Father and did the miracles and signs trying to draw men to himself, and he wept and he cried over Jerusalem because they weren't willing to come to him. And he brought judgments and stuff upon people because they weren't willing, and he was sorrowful that he even had to do that because they rejected him. But I think that he had a plan and a purpose. He can turn back. So we see Jesus' first prayer here in verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He was probably about 15 to 60 feet away from the disciples. Luke twenty-two forty-one says about a cast of a stone. He fell on his face in reverence to his father, saying, O oh, Father, and Mark uses the word Abba, uh, also translated as Daddy. So he's saying, Daddy, I need some help right now. I'm on my face right now, and I just need you. You ever go through those times where like, oh, Lord, do I have to really go through this? This is too much for me, Lord. This is beyond what I can bear, Lord. I don't want to do this anymore. We've all been there. Years ago, I was going through something that was just so stressful. I started to rock like a baby. I was like just crying on my knees and just rocking like this, going, Lord, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. You know, and it was tough. And Virginia, they're trying to comfort me. Uh, times of stress. One time she was praying for me, and uh, she was a little disappointed in me, I guess. I wasn't the man she thought I was. I pretended to be. And she was just kind of trying to encourage me to buck up and stop crying like a baby. And the Lord showed her as she began to pray that there was this demon over me with a dagger trying to kill me. And she said, wow, just, I need to be in prayer right now. And the enemy will oppress us. 
He'll come upon us and try to destroy us with our feelings and our emotions. And so Jesus prays to the Father. He pleads for His will. Lord, take this away from me, Lord. I don't want this cup here. I need it to pass. It doesn't need to be around, Lord. If there's any other way, any other uh, suffering, someone else, uh, something else that, that someone can do, then please, Lord, take it completely away. This cup is an Old Testament uh, word that's used, and it has association of suffering of the wrath of God. That's interesting. Not just suffering, but the suffering of the wrath of God. Psalms, one six, or Psalms 11, 6, Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. So it has to do with the wrath of God. And so Jesus is saying, Lord, this is your cup that you're giving to me. You're handing me your wrath that's about to come upon me. Is there another cup? <laughs> Is there another way? Ezekiel 23, 33 says, you will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow. The cup of horror and desolation, desolation will come upon you. If it's possible. No, it's not possible. There is no other way. It's only Jesus that could do it. All other religions are false except Christianity. How can you say that? Because there is no other cup. It is only this cup. The cup that the Father gave to Jesus. His wrath that would be poured upon Him is the only cup that is the true cup. Every other cup, if you're a Jehovah Witness, if you're a Mormon, if you're a seven-day Adventist, certain of them, if you're Church of Christ, certain churches of Christ, they're all based upon their works. You have to give your life for two years and be a missionary you think you can see heaven you have to live under the old testament and eat the dietary laws if you want to see heaven you have to believe in jesus christ not being a bodily form but a spiritual form and he wasn't god he was michael the archangel and again they're all false there there is no other cup even catholicism who believes that infused a righteousness in a sense it was infused in other words yes christ paid for it but now we have to maintain it no we don't have to maintain it jesus paid for it once and for all there is no other cup and so we see as humanity here the pain of the crucifixion and yet could it be that jesus was more concerned about the wrath of god that was going to come upon him jesus death meant suffering and because it was a death for sin there's that association of God's wrath being laid upon him. So he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And this is the first time that Jesus uses this phrase here. Not as I will, but as you will. His first request included his desire. Lord, this is my will here. And he's describing his will to the Father. And that is not to receive this cup from you i don't want it and if you can give it to someone else or take it away somehow then good and so you see the battle of his flesh the flesh not wanting to bear that cup now it doesn't mean that sin because he didn't give in to it but the battle was there and that's how the flesh works see we're flesh and this body always desires the spirit within this body is what God uses to bring about his righteousness. That's the part of us that is good because of Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again. But the flesh itself is not any good at all. It's perishing, the Bible says. And one day it will be destroyed, and we will put on a new body, a resurrected body, a mortal body. So this flesh is perishing. And so he didn't want to take that cup. And you hear the battle between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit that's within this body itself. And it's the flesh that says, I don't want to go to church. It's the flesh that says, I don't want to pray. Oh, I don't want to be a good person right now. Oh, that guy made me really upset and I'm not going to be a good person right now. That's all the flesh. And the spirit's saying, yes, you do want to go to church. It's the right thing to do. And you know you should be doing that. 
And the Spirit is saying, even though that guy did that to you, they did it to Jesus, and you need to take it, and you need to humble yourself, and you need to be nice anyway. You know, that's the Spirit speaking and battling against the flesh. What is my will? <laughs> my will basically is passing desires, isn't it? It really is. And the older I get, the older that we get, it, it just seems like what I believed and thought and, and had passion for has passed away. It's, it's gone. It's not there anymore. So I don't have very much of it left anymore. So my thing is, Lord, your will be done. At this stage in my life, I'm not about goals and dreams for the future. I'm just like, Lord, just keep us alive every day. And whatever you want to do, do. Because you know? I could have dreams and goals and they'll come and they'll go and some of them will, be, will come true and some of them probably will not come true. But those are all fleshly desires that just come and they pass away. Different perspective. What we need to do is surrender to the Spirit of God and say, Lord, your will be done, whatever it is that wants to be done. That's what I love about Calvary Chapel. <clears throat> I was When I was trained in Calvary Chapel when Chuck was here, he didn't have visions. He didn't have um, goals. You know, this is our five-year plan. Here's our 10-year plan. Here's our 15-year plan. And here's where we want to be in 20 years. His thing was, I just want to get through the Bible this year. I just want to teach it and let God do what he wants to do. The whole Greg Laurie crusade thing, I remember when that happened. Chuck just felt, I think God just wants Greg to, to teach on Monday nights. And so, hey, Greg, will you teach on Monday nights? Yeah. The kids just came, and it just grew. He said, well, let's just have a little crusade out there at the amphitheater and see what happens. <sighs> packed out. Let's do it again next year. <sighs> packed out. Now it's Harvest cr Crusade. What, 25 years? No. But it's been going on. Just the move of the Spirit. No goal. No like, okay, I'm um, Pastor Chuck. Greg, this is what I, th I think we should do. We'll start on Monday night. In five years, uh, we'll have a crusade. And in 10 years, you'll have a 25-year uh, Harvest Crusade going on. Or who knows how long you'll become the greatest evangelist of our civilization that wasn't his his dream it's just lord whatever you want to do just do it lord i know we can become goal oriented and that and that's good to a certain degree but lord not my will your will be done what we need to do is surrender to the spirit the next verse shows his his weakness and between that battle or the weakness of ours then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to peter what <laughs> and the greek word there is very forceful and it was like what <laughs> peter wait a minute we were just in the upper room didn't you say that you'd never deny me like yes lord <laughs> what time is it <laughs> you know so is it like are you we still out here i thought we were in the in bed now you know could you not watch one hour with me poor peter Verse 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Boy, he's saying that at that moment from, from personal, personal application, right? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is so weak. My flesh is weak right now, and that's why I'm praying. You need to be praying because you're going to enter into temptation, Peter. In, in a little bit, they're going to question you. They're going to ask you if you know me and you're going to deny me, Peter, in a sense. He's bringing it all back to his memory. So you need to be praying, Peter, for strength and power. Be careful when you think that you stand, least you fall. Because that's what pride does. We shouldn't assume those things. <clears throat> Watch. Give strict attention to Peter because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against rulers and darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And we need to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Someone said, when Jesus was showing the victory of the spirit over the flesh, the disciples were manifesting the victory of the flesh over the spirit. <clears throat> and that's usually the case with us. And that's why we need to be on our knees. His second prayer, notice in verse 42, a second time he went away, prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And at this point, Luke twenty two forty four talks about him literally sweating drops of blood at this second point. A little different 
wording as his first prayer. In his first prayer, it was, if this cup cannot pass away from me personally, you know, unless I drink it, and to now where, where he's basically just saying, look, if this cup can't pass away, in a, in a sense, he's lessening it now and focusing more on the Lord's will and not my will. And that's how our prayers should always go. And it usually does go that way, right? When we come to the Lord and say, Lord, why do I have to go through this? Or do I really need to take this situation? And the next thing he knows, Lord, okay. So I have to take this situation and I have to give in to your will. And then, the, you know, we keep praying. We're like, okay, Lord, then your will. Give me strength. Give me power. I'll get through this. That's how we usually pray. We pray that way when we face an enemy. Lord, I really hate this guy. You need to do something about this guy. You need to really take care of him. All right, Lord, you love us all and you love this guy and, you know, and okay, Lord, you need to save him, Lord, and you need to change my attitude to love him and maybe I can be, you know, a salt and light to him somehow. That's how our prayers always change. And that's what Jesus is doing here at this moment. He's focusing now more on the Lord's prayer. In verse 43, he came and found them asleep again and their eyes were very heavy. <clears throat> we totally failed, don't we? <laughs> We just fail. And God is so good to love us still. I mean, read your Bible and what happens? Your eyes get heavy. Right? You want to go to sleep at night? Start reading your Bible. You want to sleep in the afternoon? Read your Bible. You want to sleep at that time where you don't want to sleep? Read your Bible and you'll fall asleep. Because the enemy wants to keep you away from your, your Bible, right? But watch TV and you're wide awake. You're like, wow, I can stay up all night. And you end up staying up all night. And they tell you not to watch TV before you go to bed because it does keep you up at night. But read your Bible. Why? Because we have opposition. The enemy is there. And he wants to keep us from reading our Bible. He wants to keep us from growing. He wants to keep us from that personal relationship with Jesus. Oh, but we can read magazines. We can read books. We can, I mean, I know people who love books and they love tons of books, but ask them if they read their Bible from cover to cover. And like, oh, no, I haven't done that. Really? Why is that? I find that interesting. That's spiritual. That is very spiritual. There's an opposition there that comes from the enemy to keep us from reading God's word and really knowing him. Really. I'm amazed at what I hear from Christians sometimes. It blows me away because I can tell you haven't read your Bible. Or people that come up to me and they start accusing or encouraging me to follow their way and then I ask them well have you read your Bible all the way through well no wait a minute go back and read your Bible and then come with me with that wisdom it, it, it will be different than coming to me with your worldly wisdom a lot different we need the Bible we need to be reading we need to be seeking God we need to be praying because there's an enemy that wants to destroy us the third prayer <clears throat> Verse 44, so he left them. He finally said, all right, I give up on them. <laughs> They're going to sleep. Let them sleep. Went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So this time now, Matthew just kind of reassures us that he did it again and basically gave in to the Lord's will and that the Lord's will would, would be sufficient. And then he came to his disciples and said, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go or be going. See, the betrayer is here. Can you face life's trials the Lord's way and not your way? Because that is the challenge that God has given us tonight. Not to face them in our own strength and in our own power and in our own will, but in the will of the Lord. Trusting in Him that he will get us through. Like those three Hebrew boys who were thrown into the fiery furnace who knew that they could die. They could die at that moment, just be consumed. And they said they were fine with that because they're in the presence of the Lord. But they also knew that God could deliver them too, just like our God can deliver us. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked, he saw not three, but he saw four in the fiery furnace. And one looked like the Son of Man. That's speaking of Jesus, the theophany of Jesus Christ before he was born. Jesus was in the midst of them. Jesus was always in the midst of us. If you read the Bible and 
look at some of the greatest battles, Jesus is always in the midst of them. He's always there with them, protecting them and overseeing the whole city. While they were in the wilderness, the cloud by day, fire by night, there was God leading them. God was always with them. Face your trials. Stand up and go forward, but go forward and facing them through prayer. Through prayer, knowing that this is the Lord's will because he's in total control. We're going to see this Friday when we go through John chapter 19 that, that Pilate will tell Jesus, don't you know that I have authority to let you go or to crucify you? And I love Jesus' answer. It's one that I've used so often. I, I've even used it with my boss at, at work. And Jesus said to him, don't you understand you have no authority but what my Father in heaven has given you. That's powerful. What he's saying is, look, my Father put you here to exercise the authority he's given you to crucify me because I need to be crucified to die for the sins of the world. And so the only authority that you have is what he's given you to fulfill his plan and his purpose in my life. That's power. And if we understand that, that God is working something in my life, the things that we're going through, the struggles and the sorrows, what we are going through or, or, or are going through at this moment, the losses and the pains is for a reason. And you might even be upset at someone who has authority over you. That's not fair. They made a wrong decision. They weren't right. They're not a good leader. They don't know what they're doing. Don't you know they have no authority but what our Father in Heaven has given them? That's it. And so if they're exercising it over you, guess what? God has a plan for your life. And you have to submit to that plan, whatever that plan is. Because the Lord is allowing it in your life. Someone said, I shall meet tomorrow bravely. I am stronger now. The disappointment that befall me strengthen me somehow. The dawn shall find my face uplifted, serene in the sun. And with him, my problem shifted one by one. And that's where Jesus was. Your will be done. And now he was ready. Get up. The betrayer's coming. Now the battle begins. Now the work will be done. Now the cup will be fulfilled. Let me close. <clears throat> if you're not willing, as I said in the beginning, if you're not willing to put yourself out there and get hurt, then you're not willing to be used by God because you will get hurt. It will cost you something to serve the Lord. Whether it's your time, whether it's your reputation, whether it's your relationships, it will cost you something to serve the Lord. You have to totally surrender yourself to the Lord's will to be done in your life. I was, share, I was sharing this, and I can't remember where. <laughs> this week's been crazy with all these studies. <clears throat> but I was sharing, with, maybe it was with the guys on Monday night, or maybe it was someone else that I was talking to. <laughs> Who knows, but it, I was thinking about the church. Uh, oh, I was talking about the building and how we were going to lose it about five or six years ago. And at that time, I, I was thinking to myself, Lord, I just quit work. I work for Southern California Edison. I make good money, Lord, and you made me quit work so that you could close the building down? This doesn't make any sense at all. And I was getting a little upset that that was going to happen. And, of course, the church was praying, and I didn't tell anybody about that, but the church was praying, and we were seeking the Lord on this, and God just turned it completely around. I had to come to a point where I finally said, Lord, it's, it's not about my will. It's your will be done. I quit. I can't go back now. I have to face this. I have to trust in you. I just have to hope that you're going to turn this around somehow. And he did. The owner came here and says, I have to help you purchase the building. He helped us purchase it. It went from 200000 to 135, And then someone else lent us $20,000 to put down and hold the note for free. You know, well, for interests uh, only. So it was God just totally worked it out completely. But it always comes when you surrender yourself to the Lord. Always, always. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you to surrender. Will you surrender your life to the Lord? 
Will you give your life completely over to him? The cup represents God's wrath being poured upon mankind. And yet Jesus took that wrath himself. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't his idea to create hell for us. It was for the angels that had rebelled against him. The wrath was coming upon them, not upon us. God appointed us not unto wrath, but because we reject him, wrath came upon us. But it wasn't his appointment. Salvation was through Jesus Christ. That was his appointment. 1 Thessalonians 1 10, For we wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's Jesus who delivers us from the wrath that is coming. And I love this in John, 1 John 2 2. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Propitiation, what is that? The sin offering. And the idea there is, is kind of a, a, a heathen worship uh, event where they're going to take a sacrifice and offer it as an offering to appease the anger of the volcano God, in a sense. That's the picture there. And so Jesus has become the offering to appease God's anger upon the world. That's what Jesus did as the perfect offering for us. The gospel is clear. That Jesus has come to restore broken relationships with God. Jesus has come to reunite us in, in love. And it's evident of that love by the crucifixion on the cross. His very life for our life. And so his finished work on the cross made it possible for mankind to have eternal life. Someone said to believe means salvation. To reject means damnation. If you believe in jesus you have eternal life but if you reject jesus then damnation is upon you it doesn't have to be though you can accept jesus christ as your lord and savior and he said that he would give you eternal 